Great. So welcome, everybody. Um, thanks very much for, for uh, joining us for this webinar. Um, this is the, uh, I suppose, official launch of the results from the survey we did. Um, and um, it is a survey of community planning officials. I'll explain in a second what that means. Um, we did um, share the draft uh, last December at the Community Planning Network, and we got uh, really useful feedback. And now that feedback has been incorporated alongside feedback from uh, a number of other organizations and, and people working in community planning. So uh, thanks to all of them for, for the feedback. Um, the report and the summary of the report will be available online or probably are already available online. Uh, we will provide you with the links as part of this presentation. I, I should say that the the research team was broader than just myself. Um, I should probably say that I'm Oliver. Um, I was looking at the registration list and I know many of you or uh, quite a few of you. So it's great to see, uh, well, it's great to, to have uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, and also some of the people who so far we haven't managed to uh, meet or work with. So it's great to welcome you as well. And I'll explain in a second what, what Works in Scotland is about. Uh, but the research team also includes uh, Ken Gibb and more Candlick and Seda Weekly. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard about What Works in Scotland, um, we are a four-year research program. We are coming to an end now. Uh, so we will be uh, wrapping up uh, and concluding the program in December this year. Uh, and over the last uh, three years and a half, we've been um, trying to work with a number of organizations and people uh, at the front line of public services, both in the public sector and the third sector, to try and improve the way evidence is used to inform public sector reform, public service reform. Um, and indeed to try and see if we can contribute to improving public services and uh, advancing a number of current policy agendas on the ground. Uh, you have the link to our website right there on the screen. Um, if you are not uh, subscribed to our newsletter, um, I would encourage you to do so if you are interested in anything related to uh, the implementation of um, the guidance from the Christie Commission on the Reform of Public Services, because a lot of our remit is about advancing those different elements from Christie, from prevention to participation, partnership, performance, and so on. Um, and this is our hashtag. Uh, that's the hashtag for Twitter uh, for What Works in Scotland, and that's my um, hashtag as well. So feel free to do some tweeting as I speak, especially if you get bored, which hopefully you won't. Um, um, and I want to start by thanking everyone who helped us to do this survey because it it really is um, uh, thanks to um, the, the 107 community planning officers and community planning managers who took the time, uh, and it was a long survey, uh, who took the time to uh, fill it in, uh, but also to uh, over 12 organizations that helped us to shape uh, the questions for the survey. Uh, I should say that this is the first wave, wave of the survey. There is going to be a second wave uh, that is going to go live quite soon. Uh, and so some of you working in community planning will see it coming um, into your inboxes in one way or another. And we hope that you will help us with the second wave as well. Because although the findings here are, uh, I think, uh, interesting, um, we, will be we will have a more robust set of findings once we can compare the two waves. Um, now, to place things in context, uh, and I imagine that most of you will be familiar with community planning, community planning partnerships, um, community planning work, community planning uh, officers and managers, but some of you might not, um, and, and therefore I just want to kind of remind ourselves a little bit about uh, the context for this. Um, so, uh, Community planning partnerships, in essence, are the governance structures that are that mirror our local authorities in Scotland. So there are 32 community planning partnerships mirroring 32 local authority areas. Um, and they are uh, supposed to be and designed to be 
um, uh, spaces where we combine partnership across sectors, uh, across a range of uh, um, stakeholder organizations uh, uh, in combination with community engagement so that communities feed into developing priorities and uh, influencing decision making at local level. So that's the, uh, in theory, what, what CPPs are. Um, and they are not a unique feature um, in the sense that they, they are not unique to Scotland. We find all around the world um, um, attempts and efforts and arrangements that try to combine partnership work and community engagement as part of a coherent structure to try and improve public services and achieve uh, better outcomes. So um, community planning officials, CPOs, um, they are uh, the coordinators, the people who are driving a lot of the uh, everyday work uh, of CPPs, coordinating the work amongst different partners, uh, providing the facilitation for many of the spaces where different um, stakeholders and communities come together and so on and so forth. And they are at the forefront of uh, three very important policy agendas in Scotland at the moment, public service reform, following from Christie, um, social justice, all the talk we uh, now um, hear about inequalities and tackling inequalities and so on, and also community empowerment, including uh, advancing the latest legislation from the Act. And yet, despite being such a, such a crucial um, group of policy workers at local level, we know very little about this community of practice. And I only realized this um, when, when I was doing my PhD, I spent two years shadowing a group of community planning officers and community planning managers. And um, there is a lot of evidence from single case studies in one community planning partnership or another, in one uh, local authority area or another. Um, but often when I was presenting findings from these qualitative studies and previous uh, qualitative studies, um, what people often say is, well, you know, um, these are, um, uh, these are single cases. These are the findings for a particular um, uh, CPP, for a particular local area. And um, we need to know more about um, how community planning officials across the country feel about some of these issues. So the motivation for the survey was to build on that qualitative research that was there before, case studies, interviews, um, ethnographic work by shadowing people and learning about their everyday work, um, and to them take the learning from those uh, case studies and qualitative data and turn it into a survey that um, aimed to give community planning officials a chance to speak to some of those issues. Okay, uh, so this is what we try to do in this report. And it is the first survey of community planning officials, and that includes both managers and officers. This is not just about managers. It's also about officers. It's not just about those working at a strategic level um, in CPP boards or thematic groups or executive groups. It's also about officers working uh, at the local level um, and in, in the more kind of uh, uh, at the more grassroots level of the CPP. Uh, what we do in the survey, we ask questions about the role of community planning officials, we ask questions about key dynamics in CPPs, about the use of evidence, about community engagement and the role of community engagement in CPPs, and uh, about a range of policies, frameworks and reforms that are currently reshaping how community planning works. Uh, we also ask about some of the achievements, some of the challenges and so on. Uh, but the important thing to reiterate here is that this is the baseline for a second survey that will be uh, open uh, quite soon. Uh, so the findings that we will be able to present uh, in October, once we compare the, this first survey and the second survey, um, will be I, I, it will be a more robust set of findings. And I, at the final conference of What Works in Scotland, which will take place in November, we will be uh, presenting uh, this final uh, broader and uh, a more robust picture of community planning uh, from the perspective of community planning officials. Now, some methodological notes. Um, so what we did, we, we first tried to see if there were available lists um, of, um, if there was a list of community planning uh, officers and managers. And the lists that we uh, were able to access were not very updated. And um, uh, so we concluded, um, and also the information I need to say in CPP web 
pages uh, was um, also not very updated. So we ended up uh, writing to all community planning managers and asking them to define who was in their team. So this is not us saying who is in the community planning team. These are uh, the managers and the team leaders defining who forms their team. And the only, the only criteria that we um, asked them to consider was that we wanted people who spend most of their time on community planning. Um, and uh, this led us to reach out to 171 community planning officials, managers and officers of both a strategic and local level. Um, we were fortunate to get uh, 107 responses, which is a good response rate. Um, and those responses came from 29 out of the 32 uh, community planning partnerships. Uh, the split between men and women is, as you can see on the screen, around 40% men, 60% women. We're not sure if this is reflective of the entire uh, population of community planning uh, officials uh, because it's really difficult to get data on the full um, uh, population of practitioners. Uh, the age group, as you can see there as well, we, uh, a majority um, is 36 or older, uh, but there is still a 20% contingent of younger community planning uh, officials. And we want to note the limitations of this study because it was really genuinely difficult to map a, a workforce that is actually changing quite often. Many community planning teams change uh, often. Uh, people uh, move on to other posts or uh, um, uh, teams grow or um, um, uh, or become smaller and so on. Um, so it was, um, it was quite, a, quite a challenge. Um, and also we need to say that a lot of what we do in this report is basic descriptive statistics. We cannot do a lot of very sophisticated statistical testing because we have a small sample. Um, there is also a challenge with the categories that we created in, in making a difference between um, uh, local and strategic community planning officials um, because these categories are not clear cut. Um, some people who work at the strategic level are, are also doing work at the grassroots and vice versa. So what did we find? Uh, let me say something quickly about um, the workforce um, as a whole. Um, uh, this is a highly educated workforce. There is a wide range of professional backgrounds and experiences. Oh, okay. I can see some screaming from outside, so let me close the window. I thought we finished the strikes. Um, hmm, I think there are some people still on strike. Okay. Um, so, um, it is a widely, um, um, it is a very diverse uh, workforce in terms of professional backgrounds and experiences. Um, uh, two thirds of them, almost two thirds, were have been in post for more than four years. Uh, but that also reveals uh, that there is a big chunk of the community planning workforce that actually uh, is new to the job um, and, and therefore there are implications for training and support and so on. When we asked about job satisfaction, um, uh, you can see on the screen uh, that the majority uh, say that they were satisfied with the job, either fairly or very satisfied. Uh, only a small, a small minority of 8% say that they were completely satisfied. Um, and then um, uh, around 14% uh, felt dissatisfied with the job. We expected to find more dissatisfaction. Uh, we started with a hypothesis that we were going to find um, much more because qualitative studies have shown that there is a lot of burnout in this community of practice. Um, uh, the pressures of the job and the multiplicity of roles that you need to take when you're a community planning worker, um, all those things, plus uh, the challenges of navigating the political context and the local governance context and all the challenges of uh, making partnerships work and so on, all of that we know from experiences of shadowing and interviewing people uh, produces uh, quite a bit of burnout. And a lot of people move on from these jobs or try to um, take on other roles after they uh, become disenchanted with this role. So, uh, but the survey doesn't quite capture that. Um, in the second survey, we are going to try to be a bit more blunt in trying to capture this. So we are going to ask people about uh, burnout and see uh, what we can find out. Uh, it might well be that we were completely wrong in many of the qualitative studies, and actually this is a workforce that is pretty satisfied with the job and they cope well with the tremendous pre pressures they are under. Um, we also found out that community planning workers are based on a wide range of uh, uh, departments and institutional um, um, 
they, they don't have you don't find them always in the same department everywhere um in some places they're in the chief exec's office in some other places are attached to um uh, broader uh, umbrella terms like communities or um uh, people or um uh, some of them also attached to democratic services and so on and so forth um so there is no natural institutional space for these teams uh, and that's not surprising because they do have cross-cutting roles that tend to be uh, they are not easily boxed within the uh, boundaries and functions of traditional local authorities. And, and we find this in the literature. We find um, uh, that, that this is a new type of policy worker because it's not, uh, you know, the role is not just about one particular policy area, um, as housing or environment or transport or health. It's actually, um, it cuts across all policy areas, most policy areas, uh, because it's about the processes of partnership and participation around a range of policy areas. And this is why in the literature, they are called boundary spanners, people who try to foster collaboration and work across boundaries. Um, they are also called deliberative practitioners or public engagers, people who work to involve communities of place, practice and interest. Um, and in some of the literature, uh, their role is also recognized as knowledge brokering trying to um, connect uh, different types of evidence um, and bring it into policy and practice. So in many ways, the community planning official uh, combines these different roles. And this is um, a fairly new configuration uh, uh, for the profile of a public servant. We find it in other countries. It's not a challenge exclusive to Scotland, but it does mean um, that um, uh, they are often um, uh, unrecognized um, because uh, it's not easily identifiable as the traditional label. So I work in housing or I work on transport or, or whatever. Um, when we asked um, the respondents to tell us about the three most important aspects of their work, um, you, as you can see on the table, I'll give you a second to take it in. Um, the top aspects is um, the boundary spanning role, working across organizational boundaries. Now, this is surprising. Uh, uh, sorry, this is unsurprising because we know that one of the challenges of partnership work is to try and um, bring together uh, people from a range of organizations with different uh, uh, um, lines of accountability, different priorities, and so on. Um, the other top aspect of the work is involving communities in policy and decision-making. Um, so those two come at the top. Um, when people are asked about the three most important aspects, um, uh, as you can see, there's a range of them, but uh, those two come at the top. We also asked respondents um, to tell us um, whether they're, where where they should be putting more energy and more time and you can see at the bottom of the slide there um that they thought that more energy and more time more effort is necessary uh, on those four items uh, in, involving communities in policy and decision making managing dialogue and deliberation between different groups encouraging culture change and using evidence to support policies and projects um, now, the culture change issue is, is as, as many of you um, will be aware, uh, is, is the label we often use when we don't quite know how to get at the softer side of um, the challenges in community planning and in other policy areas. Um, in the sense that, um, as we say in the introduction to our report, very often reforming community planning and reforming governance structures more broadly often focuses on structures, arrangements, the kind of hardware, if, if you like, to use a computing metaphor. Uh, but um, it, we have a fairly good sense uh, that what really matters, and this is recognized in the literature and is recognized in this survey, is the software if you like, the mindsets, the approaches, the ways of thinking, the values, the ways of working, all that kind of softer stuff that is more difficult to um, understand and, um, and improve. Um, so um, uh, this um, uh, the, the survey does give us a sense that this community planning uh, workforce does see culture change as a key um, aspect of improving community planning and um, and that kind of work can be quite demanding because when I remember from the two years I spent shadowing um, community planning workers the um, 
one of the things that was apparent is that when they were hired, no one told them that they were going to be at the forefront of this mega culture change program that is seeking to reinvent the way we do public services and the way we govern ourselves locally. Um, usually the job uh, applications for community planning positions will have to do with coordination and a number of management skills and so on and so forth. Um, but this um, um, notion that they will also be expected to do the kind of culture change work that is about values, and in that sense, political, um, in so far it is about values. Um, that's often not in the job descriptions. And so we wanted to test um, this idea because in one of our studies, we found that there is a spectrum of approaches to uh, community planning. Some people take a, a fairly administrative approach, and that means that they go by the book and kind of um, uh, take a fairly administrative uh, uh, approach to doing things. We say more about this in the report if you're interested. Uh, and then at the other side of the spectrum, we find those who are activists within uh, community planning. So they are community planning workers who are much more prepared to uh, act as internal activists trying to make things happen. And um, so we ask these two questions. This is the, uh, um, we ask them to uh, we ask the respondents to to um, uh, tell us their level of agreement with these two statements. And as you can see on the top, uh, the statement it is important to sometimes bend the rules to make things happen in this job. Um, a majority of respondents uh, agreed with uh, that, uh, and that's a, a strong statement because bending the rules is not the kind of expression you would usually um, hear public servants. Uh, public servants using. So this gives us a sense of the strength of feeling in terms of uh, what it takes to make things happen in the community planning context. You do need to push the boundaries. You do need to go beyond the nine, nine to five administrative kind of mindset. And that, again, uh, has some relationship to uh, the potential for burnout in the role. Um, and when we ask them the, the converse uh, question or the, the uh, statement about whether community planning work is mainly administrative, they uh, a majority of them disagreed, as you can see there, which leads us to tentatively conclude that there is a strong presence of activist approach because in our experience with qualitative in-depth studies, that's sometimes what it takes to make things happen in the community planning context, to be flexible, to be creative, to push the boundaries, uh, to throw the book out of the window and try to make things happen um, in innovative ways. Uh, now, in terms of the skills present in the workforce, um, we, as you can see, the top skills that the respondents uh, noted uh, were writing for different audiences. This is not surprising. Uh, the role of the community planning worker, like most policy workers today, is a life of meetings and documents, documents and meetings, meetings that produce documents and documents that produce meetings. And, um, and that's the reality of policy work in the 21st century, not just for community planning workers, but um, across policy spaces. Um, then uh, this is followed closely by consultation and engagement skills, facilitation, negotiation, team management, and so on. So a broad range of skills present in the workforce. Uh, when we asked about the importance, uh, what, what skills are most important, you can see there was a almost unanimity that consultation and engagement uh, were uh, key skills uh, necessary for the role, followed closely by negotiation, persuasion, facilitation, all these skills that go into taking an activist approach to community planning, where you're trying to make things happen uh, by interacting and um, persuading, facilitating, and so on. There are a number of other important skills, of course, um, uh, presentation, public speaking, the use, uh, the finding and sharing evidence, and so on. Um, we asked about training as well, and um, we, wanted to understand the level of training that people get when they get into these roles. Uh, half of respondents say that they have no uh, training in the traditional sense. No one trained them on community planning as such. Um, uh, quite a few of them learned the job from documents or were trained by, well, a, a few of them were trained by someone with the same position. And then there's some other, um, a, a smaller group of people who um, had some level of group training or were trained for, by someone else. We asked as well, what, what are the desirable um, uh, kind of uh, training opportunities that they would be um, um, 
happy to to have. And this was an open question. So, but um, we rank responses here thematically. Um, a lot of desirable training related to leadership and management, uh, mediation and facilitation, research methods, community engagement, and so on and so forth. I won't read through everything because, of course, you will have the slides, you will have the report. Um, so I'll keep moving forward uh, so that hopefully uh, you're still with us. And um, I should say that I reckon that I have 10, 12, perhaps 15 minutes max left. So please hold on in there and then we can open up the questions. Um, now, we ask about the use of evidence, and you can see here, and you can read the detail in the report, that uh, the sources of evidence that are used most often um, are um, come from partnership with others, um, uh, to some extent um, as well from uh, internal research uh, in their organization, uh, and um, often as well uh, through public consultation. Uh, that doesn't mean that the other sources are not um, used, uh, but these were the ones that were highlighted um, as being used most often. Um, but there, there's some more nuance in the report about um, some of these uh, elements, because uh, only 33% say that they make full use of the data sources that other partners in the CPP uh, have. And in a sense, that is um, perhaps a concern because it raises the question of whether people are feeling confident and, um, and, and feel trust uh, in terms of sharing evidence between partners. It seems that there's an opportunity to improve how this is done, and we'll come back to this in the uh, recommendations. Um, a lot of the focus uh, um, in using evidence is about using evidence to assess outcomes and to some extent as well to assess value for money uh, and to achieve SOA outcomes. I should note that the survey took place uh, before the LOIPs, before the local outcome improvement plans were in place. So that's why it refers to the SOA. But the next survey will reflect the changes. Um, 50% reported that their team had expertise in evaluation. This was somewhat surprising because uh, community planning teams don't tend to be very large, with some exceptions. And therefore, um, expertise in evaluation and other important areas is often um, from other parts of the council uh, or even other partners. Um, but they all, the majority of, of uh, respondents concluded that um, community planning could be improved by better use of evidence and evaluation. So this is an area with a lot of potential for improvement. Um, I don't think I want to go into the detail of this table. Uh, I just want to give you the headline in terms of the challenges that uh, community planning partnerships face in using evidence. The top challenges, as you can see there, are capacity and resources to undertake their own research and capacity and resources to commission research from others. And when we ask specifically about statistical data at the bottom, uh, you can see that again, capacity and resource to undertake our own data analysis comes at the top uh, alongside um, the difficulty of finding data that is appropriate for the spatial scale, meaning that too often the data that we have is for a geographic area that doesn't correspond with the geographic area that we're working on. Um, then we wanted to understand as well what happens in community planning meetings. Uh, we had a lot of evidence from qualitative research in previous studies, uh, but we wanted to take this further and ask for the perspective of these community planning officials. Um, so we find that community planning meetings at all levels, and this goes from the board to uh, thematic groups, to local area partnerships, to neighborhood partnerships or local forums. Um, and all these things are different in different places and they go by different names. Uh, but um, we wanted to check and the detail is in the report and you can see the breakdown across all those different spaces. Here I'm just bringing the headline, which uh, says uh, something not really surprising. Um, we know this from the reports from all the to Scotland and others, uh, that these are spaces where there is a lot of information sharing and to some extent, uh, uh, joint coordination and planning. Uh, to a lesser extent, there is some sharing of decision making, particularly in local forums and area partnerships. That seems to be where there is more shared decision making. Um, and there's also some uh, reviewing of each other initiatives. The one thing that is very clear, and you can see that in the graph, which uh, only picks up um, the um, uh, basically the, the percentage of meeting types that were respondents selected the option a lot 
as in this is what happens in this meeting and this is what happens a lot. Um, as you can see, sharing information comes on top and at the very bottom comes sharing budgets. So community planning meetings are not seen as spaces where partnership working is about sharing budgets. Uh, in the next survey, we're gonna ask more broadly about resources because we understand that it's not just about budgets, of course, but um, yeah. Um, now, uh, in terms of inclusion, uh, who takes part, um, we measure both external inclusion and internal inclusion. And what that means, external inclusion is about who makes it into those spaces, is whether you get a place at the table. And internal inclusion, in contrast, is about once you are at the table, do you get um, uh, uh, an equal opportunity to participate and influence? So. External inclusion is about making into the making it into the space. Internal inclusion is about having influence at this space and having an equal opportunity within that space. Uh, in terms of external inclusion, uh, the CPP boards are uh, very diverse. There is, of course, a strong public and third sector present, and uh, there is weaker community representation, but more than we were uh, expecting. Um, and. 50% uh, say that their community planning board features community representation. And this used to be, I think, worse, um, I, although I can't prove it because we don't have a previous survey. Uh, but I think that this is a good sign and we might see some change uh, in the next survey. Now, in terms of internal inclusion, um, in terms of the dynamics that take place at the board, um, you can see on the left, the blue column is about the statement, uh, the different partners at the board have an equal opportunity to influence the board's decisions. And uh, you can see that there is um, it's a mixed picture um, with less than half um, ag uh, agreeing to the statement uh, and just over a third uh, disagreeing with the statement. So the, the picture is quite um, mixed across uh, different CPPs. When it comes to the third sector in particular and whether they are treated as an equal partner, uh, just 70% uh, of respondents agreed with the statement, which was surprising to us because in some other studies, uh, including our own studies, we have come across uh, third sector interface representatives who don't feel equal partners in the CPP. So this was interesting and there's more detail about this in the report. Uh, now, in terms of what we call deliberative quality, which basically is about the extent to which the board and, and these spaces are spaces where there is robust challenge, scrutiny, um, uh, opportunities to engage with disagreement and so on. So we had these two items, these two statements, um, and both of them, uh, I won't take you through the detail, but the detail is in the report. They do indicate that these are not spaces that are seen as uh, places where people can scrutinize each other, disagree, and sort of engage in the kind of difficult job of scrutinizing different approaches um, to uh, achieve outcomes. So um, that, to me, is worrying, but uh, there's more detail in the report about this, and we can come back to it in the Q&A. Um, we also asked about more broadly relationships between partners. And again, we got a mixed picture, but uh, to some extent, uh, um, it's fair to say that uh, there, there, there seem to be quite a few unproductive relationships um, uh, between partners in, in, in a number of CPPs. Uh, that's nothing surprising. We've seen that from previous reports, but this kind of confirms that uh, to some extent. Although, again, it's a mixed picture and, and there's a lot of people who didn't want to either agree or disagree, uh, which is always intriguing. Um, there are also issues to do with sharing the SOA as a shared framework. Um, we will check for the local outcome improvement plans whether um, things are changing in that sense. Um, then when it comes to the added value, we asked whether uh, CPPs are having an impact and what is the added value? What will happen that wouldn't happen without CPPs? Um, um, we, we were quite, um, uh, we were delighted to receive a lot of responses on this item with lots of examples of uh, projects that are um, dealing with um, very complex issues and very important issues um, from safety to care for children and the elderly, support for refugees, drugs, alcohol, employment, tackling poverty and so on and so forth. Um, nonetheless, uh, many respondents were skeptical about the extent to which uh, 
the community planning part see the value of partnership work. Um, so uh, CPPs sometimes are, um, in, in many cases, I think it's fair to say that they are seen as uh, secondary uh, spaces for policy and decision making. What that means is that we get a sense uh, from the survey, but also from previous qualitative studies, that uh, for some of the players in CPPs, uh, this is not a space where things happen. Um, um, a lot of the important decisions are made elsewhere in bilateral engagement between uh, some of the bigger players um, and, and so on. So um, uh, one of our conclusions is that CPPs at the moment, uh, and this doesn't apply to all, because again, I should say that many of them have made a lot of progress since the Community Empowerment Act was introduced and we haven't um, been able to reflect on those changes because of the timing of the survey. So there are, this doesn't apply to all CPPs, uh, but many CPPs do function more as spaces for sharing information and planning and coordinating rather than as places where co-production and shared decision-making takes place. Uh, now, the final two things I want to talk about is community engagement um, and uh, just so actually it's just community engagement and then a, a quick uh, overview of the recommendations we're making, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, so um, in terms of whether community engagement is uh, central uh, to how community planning partnerships work, um, there was a strong disagreement with the statement that community engagement is a key part of how CPPs work. Um, you, you can see it there. Uh, this is not new. We know that CPPs have made much more progress in terms of collaboration and partnership across uh, organizations than they have made progress in terms of community engagement at the grassroots feeding into how CPPs work. Um, and this is reflected on the uh, figure at the bottom, um, that connection between local partnerships and forums feeding into the work of uh, the Community Planning Partnership Board, whether this is a system that coherently takes priorities and uh, uh, ideas and recommendations and so on from the grassroots, from communities of place. Um, and, and uh, communities of place, practice and interest, and whether that's properly connected to the strategic levels of the CPP. So um, quite a, um, um, a, a small, but, but nonetheless significant uh, majority of respondents did indicate um, that uh, uh, there is to some extent that connection, but there is some way to go on this. Again, more detail in the report. Now, in terms of the types of community engagement, unsurprisingly, uh, most processes are some of the traditional forms of engagement, task groups, working groups, uh, targeted workshops, public meetings, and uh, beginning to take quite a bit of, um, uh, to be quite widespread, uh, we have also participatory budgeting. Um, what we find overall from the data on community engagement is that community planning officers are very active um, in organizing lots of community engagement processes. So what I said earlier about community engagement not being clearly connected to decision making is not um, precluding the fact that there is a lot of community engagement going on. Um, uh, so, uh, and there is um, uh, a lot of a skill in the workforce and, and indeed a lot of potential to reach a cross section of the local population. But the reality is that uh, traditional forms of engagement are still dominant and um, democratic innovations such as uh, participatory budgeting, um, mini publics like citizens' duties and so on are still quite uh, marginal in this space. So we see a lot of traditional engagement and less experimentation, whether that's good or bad, uh, that's open to debate, of course. Um, and we also notice uh, an over-reliance on intermediaries. What this means is that there are plenty of opportunities for um, those who are either community representatives, such as community councillors and others, um, but there are less opportunities for citizens who don't see themselves represented by existing groups. So we have built a system that is highly reliant on intermediaries. Final slide before the recommendations. Um, in terms of the challenges of community engagement in community planning partnerships, uh, unsurprisingly, resources and capacity. Um, there, there is a real issue in terms of um, um, trying to deal with public fatigue. There is a lot of consultation going on, perhaps too much. 
um, especially those that are inconsequential, that are not clearly connected or transparent, uh, not clearly connected to decision making or not transparent about how they fit into decision making. Um, and then we also got quite a lot of feedback on the challenges of ensuring that the engagement process is um, of high quality um, because that takes resources, it takes time and it takes um, a context where community engagement is valued and works very closely. Uh, with um, elected members and others so that is part of a coherent system of connecting the grassroots to the strategic decision making. Uh, in terms of the Community Empowerment Act, uh, again, I should note that uh, the survey took place in the early stages of the implementation of the Act, and therefore we cannot capture the more recent developments, but the second wave will do that. Um, Nonetheless, the concerns around implementing the Act had to do with resources, level of cooperation between partners, um, whether the new responsibilities were going to be fairly shared across partners, uh, the capacity of communities to engage when they are already under uh, high demands to participate in a number of uh, processes, and also the concern that the Community Empowerment Act may empower the already powerful. Um, so uh, if the Community Empowerment Act is not um, um, supported by uh, measures that help to uh, bring those communities who are already disadvantaged uh, into a position where they can make the most of the new opportunities that the Act brings, um, then we're going to be in trouble because the inequalities might increase. So communities that are already, uh, that have a lot of social capital and capacity, they will take advantage of the Act and they will run away, um, whereas communities that are at the moment behind uh, won't be able to take up those opportunities and will be left far behind. So that's the risk, and this was a strongly um, felt uh, by a number of respondents. So our recommendations, uh, and I should say that I'm not going to stop in the detail um, because obviously you can you can read them um, and you can check them in the report and here they're uh, out of context really because uh, in the report you can see why we're making that particular recommendation. But I just want to give you a super quick overview and then we'll open up uh, the Q&A. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of recommendations regarding um, uh, developing resources and evidence. We think it will be helpful to have a national census of community planning officials so that then we could more systematically um, uh, ask for their views uh, and more periodic periodically as well. Um, we think as well, recommendation number two is one of our overarching conclusions. Um, so community planning partnerships are quite good uh, uh, as collaborative governance spaces, spaces where there is um, collaboration amongst uh, organizations and strategic stakeholders and so on, but not so good as a system of participatory governance, which means it's not just about collaboration amongst sectors and organizations, but also about participation by citizens and communities of place, practice and interest. Uh, we have a couple of recommendations regarding staff development and support and providing new networking spaces for CPOs and opportunities to develop some of the skills that they uh, noted as desirable. Um, the next set of recommendations are about deliberative quality. So I added this slide, uh, which hopefully if, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you can check later. These are, this is what we mean by deliberative standards, which boils down to um, conversations that uh, are based on the best available evidence, whether that's formal evidence or uh, local knowledge, experiential knowledge, uh, conversations that are inclusive and that don't shy away from dealing with disagreements and, and that end up in uh, informed and considered uh, judgments. So those are the kind of deliberative standards that are widely recognized in the literature. And we applied these standards to measure the extent to which CPPs uh, comply with this um, high level of um, uh, sort of uh, deliberative quality. Uh, and that's why we have four recommendations on this point. And I'm not gonna dwell on them, I'll leave them there. This is a very specialized area. Not everyone is interested in communication or deliberation or public dialogue. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to you um, to, to check them out um, in your own time and we can always uh, come back to it. Uh, we also have um, some recommendations on participation and engagement. We are suggesting that the local governance review should 
look at reforming community councils so that they can be fit for purpose, not just in community planning, but more broadly in local democracy. Um, we also say a number of things about the quality of community engagement, about being clear uh, about the level of power sharing at stake, whether it is consultation, whether it is co-production, whether it is delegation, um, being transparent about um, the level of decision making that is actually being shared so that then there is no um, um, distrust and cynicism built around these processes. And um, we also say something about uh, an area that we feel quite passionate about, which is the fact that we are in this strange um, paradoxical time when we are paying so much attention to community empowerment, we have legislation, we have policies and so on, and yet a lot of our community workers force has been uh, quite diminished across the country. In some places, CLD departments have been shut, um, and in other places they have been swallowed into other things. Community development, community organizing, community education, good old-fashioned kind of community work that arguably is necessary to advance this agenda um, has become a bit of a, a Cinderella uh, uh, section in many uh, uh, local authority areas. So that's a bit of a contradiction because because we have never needed them more than now. And our community planning teams need um, to tap into those skills and those uh, and that capacity. So we are urging uh, CPPs to review their engagement teams and to make sure they are adequately resourced and supported so that the Community Empowerment Act can be implemented. And finally, uh, we are also asking that when we monitor the, the, the implementation of the Community Empowerment Act, we pay attention to the issue I mentioned earlier about um, whether we're reducing, increasing, or reproducing existing inequalities. Uh, because, and some of our other work looks at this in particular, inequalities in power and influence will result in inequalities in, in, in outcomes. Um, so we need to be careful that the Community Empowerment Act is not um, doesn't take us in the opposite direction of what it is intended to do. And that has a lot to do with resourcing, investing in local democracy, investing um, in community planning and so on. And that points to the final recommendation, which is about making sure that we communicate what is the added value of CPPs. A lot of people don't know um, about CPPs. I don't need to tell you that. You know that. Um, and it's quite um, striking to me that um, CPPs having responsibility and overview and oversight of a number of areas across multiple policy spaces and initiatives and projects, uh, and yet most people uh, don't even know they exist. Um, so their value needs to be better understood and communicated um, uh, so that people um, can see the value that, that comes out of uh, collaborating and trying to do things in this way. That took longer than I thought. So thank you for those of you who are still there. And um, I'm now going to switch the screen so that we can um, hopefully have a bit of a chat, uh, Q&A, or however you want to do Thanks, Oliver. Um, there were a couple of um, questions and comments that, that came in, so we could maybe um, uh, have a look at those as well. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, um, yeah. This um, uh, there was one question though. I confess I was trying to type and listen and um, you know respond to people at the same time. So you may have said the answer to this already, and I missed it. But um, one was just asking whether all the CPOs were employed by councils. So apologies if you you did cover that. No, I didn't. And it's a, it's a really good question. Yes, they are. Um, the main reason for that, as as many of you will know, is because the original legislation um, for community planning, which was in the 2003 Local Government Act, and it was literally two paragraphs, um, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, others will uh, uh, put me right if I'm... Uh, if I'm not right, but um, it, it was very, very, very limited and it placed the responsibility in councils. So when it came to creating a workforce to advance community planning, we started by the default of uh, placing them as part of um, the council workforce. Having said that, there are some exceptions to this and we have seen places in our qualitative studies, not in the survey, but in our qualitative studies, uh, where um, uh, community planning workers are based, uh, have a hybrid post in some places we've seen between the NHS and the council, although they are not so common. Um, so I think that's an area that is worth exploring, creating 
community planning teams that are truly cross-sectoral. Okay. Um, another comment that came in, I don't know if anyone else wants to, to um, uh, has any further sort of thoughts on, on what Oliver just said there. Obviously, feel free to either use the chat or um, uh, to let us know you want to, to speak. Pop in a question mark and, um, and we'll bring you in. Um, uh, but just uh, another comment that sort of arose as we were going along, I think this was related to engaging with communities, um, was that perhaps it would be interesting to see in the second wave um, whether social media plays more of a, a role as a method of engagement. Um, I don't know if you've got any particular views on that, or if you want to wait to see what the second <laughs> the second wave brings. <laughs> well, I, I completely agree, and actually, I, I actually remember we we are finalizing the new uh, questionnaire, which is we we are trying to keep a lot uh, of what was in the first survey so that we can compare. But there is also a lot that that was improved by the feedback we got and uh, and by thinking it uh, um, in the light of some of the more recent developments to do with new legislation and so on. And, um, uh, so we. We have some new questions that we added to do with communication channels and i think lucy you did help us to <laughs> to look into that question as well because <laughs> it will come out at the end of the questionnaire and that tries to see the extent to which um yeah social media and other channels um uh, might uh, might be having an influence but um i will double check because i want to make sure that i didn't uh, um uh, we've been also cutting to try and make it um not too long and and therefore um i will make sure that it's there Anybody else? Something you'd like to bring up? The one thing. Let me just say one more thing while we um, while we allow uh, 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 while, while people get a chance to to bring in other questions on social media. The issue, I suppose, one of the challenges is that there are two types of, of social media. There is the mainstream social media, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and so on which um, some of those platforms are um, are quite good for sort of bilateral or unidirectional communication. But they are not necessarily the best space for careful dialogue and, and, and deliberation on local issues and so on. So there are other online platforms that allow that kind of quality dialogue. Um, so I think we need to try and get a sense of what platforms are best for what? Because social media are great for publicity, for creating um, momentum around a particular process or issue. Uh, but then we also need platforms that accommodate the kind of more high quality dialogue that is needed uh, so that people get a chance to, to engage with the issues more properly than just clicking a button or um, responding shortly to, to an online to a, to a tweet or, or, or something like that. Oh, we have questions coming up. Uh, I think so Bren, um, I think is asking. Uh, uh, how, yeah, so any thoughts on formal qualifications that could be developed to support the recommendation about training and capacity building? So uh, I don't know if this requires, I, I'm not sure, I suppose to some extent, because the role combines um, skills from different traditions, so it combines the skill of the more traditional policy worker that um, can uh, uh, handle, you know, the complex writing um, for policy audiences as well as writing for communities and so on, all that kind of, alongside the skills of the community organizer that needs to be able to bring very different people together to make things happen, alongside the skills of the um, uh, uh, facilitator who needs to know how to create a space where difficult conversations can take place alongside the skill of um, being able to get a sense of the quality of a particular set of evidence before that's taken to a theme group or a board and so on. So this kind of analytical and research skills um, and so on and so forth. All these different skills are not packed in a particular discipline. They draw on different disciplines. And hence, that's the challenge. So I suppose what I'm saying is these skills can be developed uh, through practice and in some cases through some of the existing training, uh, but no training puts all those skills together. Um, so I suppose there is a scope for, for that, I would say. 
Um, there was another question about um, examples of good practice on how to engage members of the community, um, perhaps who are not engaged in traditional groups. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, um, I mean, we we did ask, but it's always difficult in these surveys because, you know, there are many questions and when you get to the open question, you don't have the energy to go in depth and so on. So we didn't get a lot of uh, examples of innovative engagement going on. Uh, beyond some of the, I suppose, more recent developments around participatory budgeting and in some cases the use of um, mini publics um uh, but um I, I suppose this is this is not different from evidence in other uh, countries where we see that um we are in a moment of transition um because some of these more innovative ways of engaging whether it's online through digital crowdsourcing or, um through some of these democratic innovations, um, we are in a period of transition and only um, um, when the right circumstances um, come together, uh, these things get a chance. And the right circumstances is not just about teams that are up for it and have been supported to develop those skills uh, or have those skills from their own trajectory, but also a political context locally that enables that kind of innovative engagement to take place. because. There's no point of doing engagement, innovative or traditional, unless um, this is properly, coherently connected to existing decision-making spaces, council chambers and other spaces. Um, so that's the challenge, and that's where we are. We are in transition from traditional to innovative methods, uh, but a lot of things need to still uh, align before um, we get to a position where um, um, we get beyond the more traditional engagement. Oh, quite a few questions here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be um, to give shorter answers uh, if that's okay. And also, I mean, we should invite if someone wants to um, switch on the microphone and make a comment. That's also welcome. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll take some of these questions that I can see on the screen uh, very quickly. Um, so Evelyn uh, is asking about the recommendations. Now, yeah, this is, I suppose this is the challenge. We 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 are hoping and we have um, presented these recommendations to the community planning network where many managers uh, were present. Um, and also we, we, we have an ongoing conversation with the community planning network so that we make sure that hopefully they can cascade some of these findings. Not everything applies to every CPP. So then it's up to community planning teams in each CPP to take whatever feels relevant locally, because that's something we cannot tell you because um, we didn't look at the specific localities precisely because we wanted that anonymity so that people could um, so feel free to really make the points they wanted to make. Uh, there are recommendations that are for um, national agencies and government. So um, uh, we are hoping that some of them are, are taken forward as well. And we will, um, once we have the second, uh, wave of the survey uh, with a stronger set of findings uh, that now allows us to compare over time, we are hoping that uh, this will fit um, into um, not just the development of community planning, but more broadly, some of the ongoing public service reforms. Um, um, yeah. Um, then, yeah, we are asked about uh, whether we could use the second survey to get to CP partners who are not council-based. Um, uh, initially, that was one thing we considered. The issue, though, is that we want people whose job is community planning. So there are a lot of partners involved. There, are, um, as you know, uh, there, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of people involved in CPPs. But we wanted to get at the coordinators, the facilitators, the brokers, um, rather than um, people who are participating as um, part of a particular uh, stakeholder group that is represented and working in partnership. So we wanted to get at the uh, uh, at those um, um, kind of um, uh, key coordinators of that space, rather than people who come into that space with a different role and just focus on a particular area. These people that we um, um, uh, that responded, they do cut across the CPP, working all sorts of policy areas. Uh, so their their role is not attached to a particular policy area, 
is uh, the role is attached to a particular type of process, whether that's collaboration or participation. So their expertise is on process rather than substance. If we inv invite community planning partners, I think it will be, um, then we cannot make statements or claims about the community planning workforce because this will be just one thing amongst a number of other things um, that those people do. That doesn't mean that we don't need a broader survey about community planning partners. I think that's worthwhile, but that is, that's different from what we're trying to do here. Um, then there's a question about community councils. Um, yeah, oof. Uh, community councils is one of my favorite subjects. And I, I've, I've had the fortune of working with many community councillors over the years. Um, we are currently reviewing the state of community councils to feed into the local governance review. Um, and uh, so we're doing this in collaboration with the Scottish Community Development Center. We should have a report before the summer, uh, but we've done this before. We, we helped uh, with the um, community councils uh, work on for the COSLA Commission on strengthening local democracy. So we have a full report with recommendations. Um, so if you, I think it's available in our website, there's a link to it uh, in the web page in What Works in Scotland where we talk about uh, our current review. So if you, there's a link that takes from our previous report. Um, so we have quite a few recommendations that come from community councillors and from ourselves. Um, Jane is asking about how to make these spaces spaces for participatory governance. Well, there are some clues in the report, although I didn't want to go too far uh, because I think we need the second wave to have a... Um, because if I make big claims on the basis of the first survey, um, they might be actually, you know, um, contestable. I think the second survey, by giving us... Uh, 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 the opportunity to analyze change and development over time will allow us to say more about that aspect of how to uh, improve the participatory aspect um, of uh, CPPs. So um, I want to be cautious on this one uh, for now. Um, and then we have Vivian, um, uh, who's tuning, wearing her professional hat as a communications and engagement lead uh, for the NHS, health and social care. Um, yep, yeah, and, and she wanted to get a better understanding of the priorities and challenges that um, community planning workers uh, face. And hopefully the report will do that. Uh, obviously, we don't expect you to go through the um, 56 pages of the report, but I should say that there is um, an eight page um, summary separate from the report. Uh, so if you have very little time, that eight uh, pager is your best option. If you have a little bit more time, at the beginning of the report, there are 10 pages that con that include a little bit more of analysis, as well as some of the stuff that is in the separate summary. And if you have a little bit more time, or um, in one way or another, a lot of what you do um, really, therefore you want to get into the detail of the report um, hopefully you can uh, check the, the the full text in some of the sections so basically I'm, I'm giving you homework Vivian sorry about that <laughs> okay did I miss any questions or does anyone want to use the microphone it would be nice to hear a voice Everybody's got the answers. Everybody's confused and puzzled and wondering <laughs> what's the best uh, way of spending lunchtime. <laughs> so maybe uh, we have just three minutes left and there are no more questions. Um, can we just perhaps super quickly um, get from those of you um, on the other side of the of the uh, of this webinar to tell us very quickly whether the webinar format um, worked for you. What can we improve? I think definitely we 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 can make the presentation shorter. I already realized that it was um, um, a bit too long. Um, so I think that that is something I'll I'll take away. Um, but what what else can we do better? Uh, did this work for you? Um, Probably I should say that the point of this was to try and, and 
a lot of our events, um, we try to distribute our events across the country, uh, but unavoidably, we do end up doing quite a bit in the central belt. Um, although we do have ongoing work in the Highlands, and we've been to Moray and um, Perth and King Rose and the West Coast and, and so on, in, in a number of things that we do. But we want to try and use webinars a bit more often um, as opportunities to, to do this uh, in a different way. Create some feedback coming through. We'll make a good note of it. That's great. It seems that it worked for most people. Um, we will be following up with those who didn't manage to log in because there were quite a few people registered, and them obviously, you know. Um, um, we all have really busy calendars, so naturally some people couldn't make it. And perhaps the prospect of having this recorded um, also um, made them prioritize something else and they will hopefully watch this recording. Um, but we will also follow up uh, with those who registered uh, and didn't log in just to check whether there were any technical issues. It was just a matter of... Uh... Uh, Jane, anything... Uh, sorry, Lucy, anything that you want to add? Um, no, that was uh, yeah. As, as you said, um, you know, obviously it was a bit of an experiment for us. Um, so we're pleased that obviously, you know, some people seem to it seems to have worked well for for, for people, and that's great. Um, and as you say, we'll follow up and sort of try and work out what um, if there were issues for other people, what that was, and if there's anything we can do um, to make it work more smoothly next time. But any feedback uh, you, that you have, um, you know, feel free to to get in touch. Um, and thanks very much for coming. Great. And uh, Lucy, I take it that we can take all this valuable feedback that uh, we got in the chat. Maybe there is a way that we can. Um, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, we can. We can. We can save that and um, uh, and and extract any kind of you know bits and pieces that are, uh, are going to be most most useful for us. So thanks very much for everyone that participated. That's great. I just want to add my thanks and um, encourage you to sign up for our newsletter in the What Works Scotland website um, and hopefully um, come along to our events and other things that are going to be happening between now and December. Um, we are really excited uh, uh, to be sharing um, a lot of findings on uh, lots of different projects within the program and all of that is going to be happening in the next few months and especially in the winter so we hope um, that you can uh, join us for for some of that and uh, yeah thanks again a pleasure it's always a bit there's always a bit of trepidation in doing these things so you never know um if technology is going to be on your side but if it seems that it kind of worked. Uh, so thanks again to Lucy. Thanks to everyone, um, those of you there live and those of you watching the recording. Take care and speak soon.